My name is John Vandewer from the Fisheries Biologist with Save the Sound, and I'm here to present a little bit about uh, monitoring river herring and their migration in the Long Island Sound region. Um, I'm really excited for this presentation. I got a bunch to cover. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and I will get to them at the end. Uh, I know myself a little bit too well and I will get distracted answering people's questions and going off on tangents. So uh, throw it in the chat and I'll get to it at the end. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So we'll start diving right in here. Um, here at Save the Sound, we lead environmental action in the Long Island Sound region. We fight climate change, save endangered lands, protect the sound and its watersheds, and also work with nature to restore ecosystems. We do that through pollution monitoring, legal action, legislative ag advocacy, and ecological restoration. So a little bit about uh, climate, Save the Sound is leading on bold climate action through policy leadership, on the ground projects that help neighborhoods and ecosystems adapt to escalating climate threats. Our lands department, Save the Sound, builds coalitions to win battles to preserve our region's threatened forests, islands, and riverfronts. Save the Sound also does a lot to protect water. Uh, we restore and protect clean water throughout Long Island Sound ecosystems through hands-on science, community collaboration, legislative advocacy, and legal action. And restoration. Save the Sound leads hands-on habitat restoration, creating lasting physical changes that strengthen natural ecosystems for the benefit of wildlife and also the communities around us. And that's kind of what we're here to talk about today. We're going to talk about fisheries restoration. Uh, and with that, there's two different kind of important things I want to cover before we dive in. One is ecological resilience. Uh, ecological resilience is the capacity of an ecosystem to rebound or adapt to a disturbance. Well, ecological restoration is the process of restoring conditions for ecosystem to thrive. So one is the resilience, rebounding from a disturbance, and restoration is restoring conditions to a thriving ecosystem. One of the ways we uh, work to restore ecosystems to their thriving, uh, to be thriving is through studying and surveying dams. Uh, there are about over 4,000 dams present in across the Connecticut landscape. Many of them have no practical or economic purpose anymore, so they often fall into disrepa disrepair and become a liability. There's a whole host of reasons why dams were built historically, which go back to industrial power from lumber and grist mills, hydroelectric power, water storage for reservoirs, ice production back in the 1800s, early 1900s uh, for ice boxes, uh, also recreation. So for swimming, boating, uh, ice skating, uh, w fishing, a bunch of different uh, dams were built for recreation. And then also flood protection. There are flood protection dams that are built, but it is important to note that not every dam acts as flood protection. So why do we remove these dams that are here? Well, for me as a fisheries biologist, my what I'm most passionate about is the fisheries passages the fish passage aspect of it. Uh, these dams often stand in the way of fish migrating upriver and also potentially sometimes downriver as well for the resident riverine fish. But upstream passage is the real issue here. So fish aren't the only aquatic organisms that benefit from dam removals as well. Uh, riverine mammals to uh, amphibians, reptiles, and also macroinvertebrates, the bugs in the river also uh, benefit from dam removal. It also improves connectivity. So we're not having segment rivers going through the watershed. It's one free flowing river, improves water quantity. Uh, some dams actually after a while fill in with sediment so they don't have enough water storage behind them, which can create problems. Along with water quality, uh, dams often create a, a really nice environment for algae and aquatic vegetation to grow from that slow warm water with a lot of nutrients getting filtered out to the bottom so harmful algal blooms can be possible as well as uh, invasive species from uh, transport 
Uh, so water quality can improve also with dam removal. Also a big thing we're doing these dam removals for is public safety. Uh, a lot, like I mentioned, a lot of these dams don't serve an economic purpose anymore. So they're starting to crumble as history progresses. So they often become a liability for the property owner who owns the dam and anything, any infrastructure, people living, anything downstream, if these dams were to breach, can create um, pretty big, pretty big issues. And also recreational use. Uh, there's been a couple instances throughout the years where we've seen uh, these dams that have become overgrown, filled in with sediment, vegetation grown up so that freshwater resource isn't accessible to anyone anymore because it's all filled in and congested. So with uh, a dam removal project, often we see increased recreational use from uh, kayakers, canoers, anglers, a whole different uh, bird watchers, a whole bunch of different different recreational uses can uh, pop up after a dam removal. So these dam removal projects are a single permanent restoration project that creates a more resilient, sustainable watershed. So how did these dam removals help key species? Well, before I get too deep into this, I wanna talk about a little bit about what a key species is. A key species is a species that if it is removed from the ecosystem, the entire food web around it can collapse. So a really good example for that is an alewife or blueback herring or overall talking a river herring. These river herring are dependent on other, sorry, other species are dependent on the river herring to be forage fish for them to have something to eat at various different life stages, whether adult or in the young of the year larval stage. So if, if river herring are deleted from the ecosystem, all of the predators that eat river herring will have a gap of their diet missing, which can cause a trophic cascade. Uh, that's a fisheries example, but a uh, key species could also be, for example, a uh, rare historic plant in some of these wetlands that are being outcompeted by invasive species and plants that are have a more gr vigorous growth rate. Um, so it expands migration. So dam removals allow these fish to move in the in and out of the rivers when they need to, and it creates more oxygen in the water instead of having a pond where there's a potential for eutrophication or all of the dissolved oxygen to be sucked out of the water through algal algal growth. Um, the free flowing river tumbling over rocks and all of that churning actually improves dissolved oxygen levels. It reduces water reduces water temperature. The dam creates a pond behind it. That pond is rather large. The sun can beat down on that hot water. The dam creates a higher residence time. How long the water is in that watershed or behind that dam, it has more time to heat up in the sun in the warm summer months. Once that river is free flowing, the residence time drops. The water's not being exposed to the sun as much, so it doesn't have as much time to warm up. So it creates cooler water temperatures. This diversifies the habitat. Not only is it now colder, but there's also that free flowing water moves some of the fine sediments out of the way, creating more nooks and crannies or interstitial spaces for bugs and small fish and things to start thriving in to create more biodiversity. Those nooks and crannies also encourage root growth and seed and seed dispersion and kind of uh, attenuation, I guess might be the proper word for that, but seeds get stuck in all these nooks and crannies, which can now grow on the riverbanks, reducing erosion. And then after a while, a canopy can grow, which will shade the river over time, reducing more of that thermal radiation coming into that water. Uh, so all of this reduces residence time with we mentioned. The natural sediment transport is now able to flow again, Dirt, rock, sediment is always flowing downstream. If a dam is in the way, the water level behind the dam is slow. All of that sediment, the total suspended solids sink to the bottom. And then once the water comes back over the dam again, it doesn't have a high total suspended solid load. So it actually becomes an eroding stream again, creating erosion downstream. And dam removal also reconnects rivers to its floodplain. If there's a pond there, there's not much more room for that floodplain to grow in high flows. So if the dam removal, the river's back in its channel, 
there's more room for the floodplain and the river to expand and contract in its natural path. So dams effect on wildlife. We, we kind of started to mention this, um, but I wanted to give this its own special slide. So dams effect on wildlife, they can act as a partial or most of the time a total barrier to upstream movement. This is a really big issue for diadromous fish or fish that spend part of their lives in salt water and part of their lives in fresh water. Those fish are a link between the salt water and the freshwater ecosystem. So these diadromous fish include alewife and blueback herring, which are collectively referred to as river herring, American shad, gizzard shad, American eel, and sea lamprey. Many of these fish are considered forage fish, which act as prey species for predators, whether it be aquatic, freshwater, or terrestrial predator, or avian predators. Uh, these fish are pretty much preyed upon by anything that can get their their mouths around them. Um, not only is this an issue for migrating fish, it's also an issue for riverine species like brook trout. Brook trout spend their entire life cycles in fresh water, but they still need areas for movement for different stages of their life cycle. Their summer habitat is different from their winter habitat, which is different from their spawning habitat. So if all of those three habitat features aren't met, brook trout populations will de decrease. Also, a fish that is pretty cool to me is a long-nosed dace. It's a really small little fish, but their riffle, their that turbulent section of the river, they're dependent on that for their habitat. They have a downward-faced, the downward-faced head, their fins suction them to the bottom as they're living in this riffle, and they're one of the first uh, species to be wiped out from a stretch of river once the water slows down enough. Um, not only fish, but also reptiles and amphibians, the annual snapping turtle migration to get to an egg laying ground can get in the way, dams can get in the way of that, and also uh, salamander migration, frog and toad migration can all be influenced by dams. Also, we mentioned the aquatic macroinvertebrates, but all of the bugs that is the baseline of the food chain in, in a river or in um, any of these waterways, uh, in, in an impounded area, all that fine sediment falling out creates kind of like a desert, lots of small particles, a lot of really fine sediment, which does not leave a lot of interstitial spaces or those nooks and crannies in the rocks for those bugs to actually survive and create a thriving ecosystem and food web from. So not only are the all of these wild fish and wildlife benefiting from dam removal, but also we mentioned water quality improve, water quality improves, the natural flow of sediment improves, and it, the river is now reconnected with its floodplains post dam removal. Dams are not the only piece of infrastructure that can influence aquatic organism passage. Road stream crossings or culverts uh, can also really influence migration of fish and movement of fish. So in this diagram here, I'm not sure if you can see where my mouse is, but these pipes here, fish have a hard time jumping up that perch, up this little waterfall here, and then swimming through the entire culvert. Now with this bridge and the other side there, a fish has a much easier time moving through that. So would a frog or a salamander. There's also dry passage for any mammals that might need to use that river corridor. But then also there's less of a flood risk from debris clogging those pipes or anything else getting in the way of those pipes. Now that that opening is much wider, there's more natural sediment transport, less debris clogging. So the DOT or whoever owns that road is going to have a lot less maintenance over time. They can put their resources instead of unclogging culverts to improving things and moving forward. So Save the Sound, along with a whole host of partners, is actively working across the state of Connecticut and now into New York to really focus on these road stream crossings and help towns come up with designs and move forward to um, really address these culverts that have just as much of a uh, detriment to fish and wildlife as these dams do. So I mentioned river herring a couple times now, so I wanna talk about why they're so important. So alewife and blueback herring, the two different species of, of river herring we have here are anadromous fish. 
That means they spend their adult lives in a marine environment in the salt water. Then they migrate to the estuaries and bays before they run up into the rivers to actually complete their spawning process. They take about three to four years to reach sexual maturity. They're considered a species of concern. So they're not yet an endangered species, but they are a concern and they are on their way if trends continue to becoming an endangered species. Uh, they're categorized as a schooling fish, so they're always with multiples. It's really, really rare to see one single alewife um, or blueback herring. They're a schooling fish. And there is a moratorium for them in New England, which means there is no take for mostly any reason. Uh, there is actually some pretty hefty fines that go along with them. So a little bit of about a description about alewife. So we know what we're looking at if we see them in the wild. Uh, they're streamlined. They're laterally compressed like a hot dog, not a hamburger. They swim this way. Uh, they're deep bodied towards the head. They're usually silver white in color, but they do have a green purple iridescence on their dorsal side, the top side of them there. They're about 10 inches long average. Their tail is deeply forked. So they're really, really good swimmers. They're really strong swimmers from being into the ocean and then being able to move inland. They have faint longitudinal lines above their midline, which helps them blend in in that school, it makes it hard for a predator to pick one out versus another. A really cool thing is they have a dark false eye spot here behind their gill plate, which really confuses predators because they can't see up or down and they have no clue where one fish starts and the other one starts because of that fake eye. Uh, and their scales also are really large and they slough off relatively easily, which helps uh, do some visual surveys at uh, areas of high alewife density. So alewife's role in the ecosystem. They're zooplanktivorous, so that means they go out and they eat all of the zooplankton in the water column. They're also known to eat small insects and fish larvae as well. And they're a forage fish. I mentioned it a little earlier in the presentation, but everything that can tries to eat alewife, from raccoons and otters to osprey to eagle to striped bass to bluefish to pretty much everything, snapping turtles, um, anything that can and will eat an alewife if it can. Uh, so they're a forage fish. They're really important to have in the ecosystem to uh, transport nutrients. They take nutrients from the open ocean as they're picking all of those rotifers, copepods, all that zooplankton. They're collecting all of that nutrients. They're storing it in their body as flesh and gametes and the milt and the roe, uh, the eggs and the sperm. They're storing that in their body. They come inland for their spawn. Their spawn, each female can produce about 30,000 to 150,000 eggs. Each egg is just under a millimeter. And on average, one hatchling out of 80,000 will reach the sea. So generally speaking, statistically, really generally, uh, it takes about two fish, a male and a female, to get one fish to return. Um, with that, all the adults are highly preyed upon migrating inland, and then the young of the year are highly preyed upon moving towards the sea. Another fish I want to talk about really quick is a sea, is sea lamprey. They're another diadromous fish. This is my shameless plug for them because I am a fish dork, and they're one of the most fascinating fish for me. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. Uh, so in the spring, they migrate inland from open ocean into streams. Uh, this chart is from the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission. It says March to July. In Connecticut, we usually see them around May. They migrate into the streams and start building a red or a fish nest. The really cool part about them is they actually take rocks and unembed them from the stream bed. They dig them out, make this big nest. So they're actually manipulating the habitat around them as they're building a nest. So then they spawn all of their eggs into this big rock mound. They hatch. It acts as an incubator. From there, the adults die. The young of the year, the larval phase, they're referred to as amacetes. The amacetes stay in soft, silty bottoms anywhere from three to ten years, depending on the resources in that river. After that amount of time, they emerge from the stream bed. They metamorphosize into the adult that you can see here at the top in that little diagram. They migrate down to the ocean. This is lakes because it's from the Great Lakes. Um, but they migrate down to the ocean where they then spend 
anywhere from a year to 18 months parasitizing adult free swimming fish. The fascinating part about these sea lamprey to me and the reason for my shameless plug is it's extremely rare to find in the North Atlantic adult fish with lamprey scars on them or an actual adult lamprey attached to them. Where do they go? No one knows from my understanding. And if someone out there does know, please reach out to me. I would love to talk to you about this. So my scientific brain is fascinated by how these sea lamprey have an entire adult phase in their life. No one's really sure what they go, where they go, what they're feeding on, but they come back every year to spawn. So where are they going? What are they doing? Is there a host fish out there that they're specifically using that we don't know about? I don't know. If you do know, please reach out to me because this is one of the questions I've been asking and cannot find the answer to. So if you know anything about sea lamprey, please reach out. Another really cool fish I want to talk about real quick, another shameless plug about really cool fish ecology is the American eel. Uh, American eels are actually cutadromous, meaning they spend their adult lives in fresh water and then migrate out to salt water to spawn. So every single American eel migrates to the Sargasso Sea between like off the coast of Bermuda, you could generally call it um, as an adult. They spawn in the Sargasso Sea then have a larval phase in the Sargasso Sea for a little bit. And then as a, a glass eel, a really small eel, they migrate into every body of water that they thrive in. And the cool thing about a glass eel stage is that they're so light that they don't break the surface tension of the water. So as long as they're in continuous water, not breaking the surface tension, they can climb vertical walls, staying in the water. So really cool. Then they become elvers. They get full size in the actual rivers and then out migrate as a silver eel, which is generally speaking, thickness might vary, but they're like about the size of your arm as they're migrating out to sea. Super fascinating, really cool. A lot is known about them compared to the sea lamprey, not as much. So back to river herring, the real thing we're talking about after my shameless fish plugs here. Um, River herring population is declining from a various different reasons, from water quality degradation to habitat loss and bycatch. River herring populations have been reduced over 90%, which is one of the reasons why we're doing this restoration is to help protect and make this keystone species thrive. If this, if these river herring are deleted from the ecosystem, the food web has a real potential to collapse. So, there's a couple more steps to understanding this fisheries restoration. It's not necessarily restoring to what is historically there. If we went and did a dam removal and modeled the entire thing for a landscape from the 1300s, that won't really work anymore because the community, the human community around it's different, the animal community around it's different, there's infrastructure around it. So modern restoration really has to understand the community, human community aspects of the broader ecosystem while focusing on those keystone at risk and indicator species. So how we do that is from monitoring. Uh, we start seeing what we need from the fish side, the human side, and we start monitoring everything together. One of the monitoring methods we use is a run of the river funnel trap. This diagram kind of shows the blue lines coming down. That's the water flowing, the black line and the fish migrating up. We block off an entire section of the river. So everything moving up gets caught in there. And then we release, come every day, survey, take a bunch of data, and then release every single thing upstream of this river to continue their migration. Um, this has been a really effective sampling method. And it is really interesting seeing what is caught every night while things move. Um, site specifics about the trapping is a little bit challenging though. It has to be in the vicinity of a dam removal, depending on the question, either upstream or downstream of a upstream of a post dam removal, downstream of pre dam removal. The water has to be deep enough to actually protect the fish. Can't be really shallow where it's in turbulence and there's nowhere for a predator, nowhere for it to go. So it has to be deep enough, but it can't be too deep because if it's too deep, the water will actually collapse the trap. 
Same thing with velocity. The velocity can't be too high or you're going to be asking that fish to stay on a treadmill its entire time it's in a trap, but it can't be too low where there's not enough dissolved oxygen in the water. It has to be a natural bottleneck so you're not blocking off a giant section of stream, but it can't be too much of a bottleneck because then velocity becomes an issue and your trap gets blown downstream. So then it also has to be in a thaw leg. It has to be in the deepest section of the river, which might not always be the center of the river. That allows the proper depth. It allows the proper current. It allows proper, uh, I'll call it in diagram B here, turbulence, chaotic energy. So fish can get down behind it, a rock or something. So it's not just sitting on that treadmill. So site selection for these trapping sites is a little bit more challenging than just here's the dam, here's where we're gonna trap. Takes a little bit of picking and choosing and trial and error. So here's a little bit of, not a little bit, here's the trapping data from uh, over the years, Save the Sound has been trapping. So start off with Pond Lily in the West River here in New Haven. Uh, the dam was removed in the winter of 2016. So the immediate following year, three river herring were captured. Following year after that, 34, 2019 was a year of really high floods. It was exceedingly challenging to keep the traps in place with really high flows. So we had seven fish bounce back up in 2020, record high 2021, three in 22, and 57 in 2023. Hyde Pond. The dam was removed that same winter, 2016, 2017, nothing returned. 2018 was an incredible run of over a thousand fish. Uh, 2019, that high flow again, blew the trap out of place a bunch, really hard to keep in spot, lost fish just swimming by the trap in the high flows. 2022, uh, 2020, sorry, the numbers were higher. 2021 was back up pretty high. Whitford Brook is actually the same river where Hyde Pond Trap was. So this was as the funding to monitor Hyde Pond was wrapping up. We started looking at barriers upstream. So we were doing surveys to see if the next barrier upstream was indeed passable or not. So the years overlap. So we are seeing here in 2020, there's over 300 fish downstream in Whitford Brook, but where we were trapping, no fish were able to make it, indicating that that was a barrier. There was a barrier between the trapping site and the hide trapping site. Same thing for 2021. There was almost 600 fish. None of them made it this high in the watershed. 2022, there was a large storm that breached the barrier. The fish were able to make it up. 2023, beaver moved in and plugged clogged up the breached barrier again, create, making it a barrier where the fish were no longer able to make it back up. Um, so that was an interesting bit of data. The Norwalk River, uh, I think some of you out there may, may have helped me uh, trap this river. This was a really challenging river to trap. The hydrograph or the amount of water moving through the river after storm events, it was very high and then would drop really low. So it often blew the trap right out of place. Uh, 2020, trap was gone. It took a couple of weeks to find it way downstream. So thanks for the TU members who were actively helping me search for that trap and recovered all of the pieces. 2021, we had awesome luck. We found one alewife uh, and that was the end of the survey. It was a presence absence survey to say, are these fish here? Are they not here? We found one, it was reported immediately the next day. Trap was pulled to show, yep, they were here. 2022 trapped again we did not find any and had some real trouble again keeping that trap in place so we had to come up with new adaptive uh sampling techniques um so we started using environmental dna and we were sampling using eDNA for short, uh, eDNA sampling, which is a relatively new technology, which just recently has become leaps and bounds with helping scientists and figuring out um, all of the potential applications this can be used in. So eDNA depends on fish releasing DNA into the water. DNA is then captured in, that, in a water sample, analyzed in lab setting, and a catalog of the species present is compiled and presence absence data is obtained. There is now kind of the cutting edge of this eDNA technology. 
the amount of pairs, e, uh, DNA sequence pairs that match is now starting to be developed to see if individuals can be picked out to get not only present absence, but relative abundance as well. Currently right now, um, I'm not 100% sure if it's to that point, but if there's an eDNA scientist out there who would like to talk more about that side of the technology, I'd love to chat, so please reach out. Um, so in 2022, we did our first sampling. Uh, I was really excited about it. We did the entire North Shore of Long Island Sound, so Connecticut and Westchester uh, County. There was two sampling days. We were aiming for an early and a late season, but by the time funding was acquired and then the sampling kits actually came, we ended up getting a kind of a late and then a little, kind of really late sampling season. But it worked out because we did get uh, diadromous fish in our um, in our samples. So just to quickly here, this is what the samples look like. There's a syringe at 60 cc's. Push it through this filter here, cap this filter, put a preservative in it, ship it off to the lab, and then we get the data back. So here's the data. I know the slide is kind of chaotic, but I wanted to show everything that popped up in these surveys, just in case anyone out there was curious. But the main thing to focus on is these green. These are our diadromous fish. Blue is resident. This orange color is actually mammals. Purple is uh, birds. And this lighter yellow, I'm going to call it, is saltwater fish. So first things first after of this, that American eel were captured in every single survey. Really interesting. Um, Blind Brook here had a, a gizzard shad as well. And the Byram River, which is the border of Connecticut and New York, had American eel, gizzard shad, and actually blueback herring as well, which was really exciting to see. There's also here uh, Alosa species, which just kind of meant that the the snip of the DNA that was caught wasn't specific enough or didn't have the genetic marker material to show if it was an alewife or a blueback herring. Here are the Connecticut findings. So again, American eel were found in every single river surveyed. Uh, the Branford River had alewife and blueback herring, which was really exciting to see both river herring species in one spot, which bumped the priority for restoration of that river and potential projects in that watershed higher than uh, originally anticipated before this study. The Farm River had American eel as well. The Monuncatasic had eel and alewife. Uh, Patchogue had alewife and eel as well. Um, and Four Mile and Fishtown had eel. Uh, so... The resident fish, there were some interesting ones or introduced fish or something along those lines, but mostly they were the resident fish you'd expect to see with a couple couple outliers, but mostly the resident fish were what you would expect. 2023, next phase of the eDNA study, this was more focused on the Norwalk River to get strong pond pre-dam removal data. Uh, so we focused specifically on uh, the Norwalk River. I have a, my next slide has a little bit more information if you're not familiar. Um, so this one, we had the samples early. So we got an early samples date, a mid sample date, and a late sample date. This coincides with when the fish run actually starts, which generally in Connecticut, it starts late February uh, to mid March, then goes through about June. So we tried to get samples throughout the fish run season. Like I mentioned, the six, the syringe, the 60 cc syringe, um, the methodology for the sample kits was the same. So like I promised, a little bit more information on Strong Pond. Save the Sound with a whole host of partners developed a plan to remove the Strong Pond Dam, which was a barrier to fish on the Norwalk River in Wilton, Connecticut. And this restored 10 miles of migratory riverine corridor for fish and improved connectivity for resident fish for spawning and thermal refuge habitat. So here are the results from the early findings. These are 100% matches. That means an entire sequence, an entire genetic code was found and positively identified for all of these fish. Again, these blue are the resident fish, the green are diadromous, red here is a mammal. So first sample, American eel was the only one surveyed for a diadromous fish. 
Mid-season, American Eel, there's more 100% pairs. Then we also got the Sea Lamp right there, which I was very excited about because the year prior with sampling, they did not come up on our surveys, even though there was visual surveys and documentation, photo documentation with timestamps and geolocated pins of where uh, sea lamprey were making nests. This year, we actually got them in the eDNA surveys, which I was incredibly excited about. And then late season, back the only diadromous fish was American eel again. So why is this research important? Uh, it shows the presence absence of these fish, not only the diadromous fish, but all of the other fish in the rivers as well. So if there's any of those river specific fish we can know we could track that over time to see if 20 years from now if there's all pond specific fish there what's going on so having presence absence data and showing the managers and the biologists working with these fish where these populations are or are not is really important so it captures that entire species assemblage instead of just one specific fish so it's a little bit easier to prioritize the rivers by knowing everything that's in them and what each of those fish indicates. So what did this research show? It showed that river herring and other diadromous fish are present post dam removal at these sites. Alewife, blueback herring, American eel, sea lamprey, and gizzard chad have all been documented at Save the Sound restoration sites. The fish are also able to pass through the post dam removal site unimpeded. And we can tell that because the fish are captured with full vigor. They're flapping super vigorously. They're really, really swimming hard. They're sometimes they're almost in really hard. I don't want to say impossible, but really challenging to get out of the traps because they're swimming so fast in their vigor. And we can also tell because their fins and scales are intact. Their fins aren't beat up. They're not missing scales. They're generally speaking in really good vigor and really good uh, physical standing. They're not beat up. So they're able to pass through these dam structures, these post dam removal structures um, really well. And this also gives up-to-date species assemblages. Some of these rivers we're surveying haven't had a species assemblage study done on them since some of them the 90s, some of them the early 2000s, some of the mid-2010s. So getting up-to-date data as things are changing, as the landscape is changing, is really important for future science as well. So all of this research is also indicating a couple other things. Uh, the freshwater conditions seem to be improving. Uh, there's better passage year to year. There's less dams and there's more passable road streams crossing every year. The water quality itself is actually improving uh, through the long uh, unified water study and the sound health explorer. You could track long-term going on 25 years, how water at various points across Long Island Sound is improving. Pollution control legislation is getting stronger and stronger with MS4 compliance and point and non-point pollution identification and mitigation. And also there's less combined stormwater and sewage outfalls every year as well. Another thing that we're starting to see is that the striped bass population is declining. There's less and less striped bass caught. There's new regulations for a slot limit, taking out the medium-sized fish are the only ones recreational anglers are allowed to catch. So that, in theory, leaves the small fish less competition and the big fish less competition, getting out rid of all of those middle fish. But there's no record of an increase of other predators taking that striped bass feeding niche. So there's no indication of more predation. So what else could be causing some of these river herring depletions? You might say, John, drought. I know, drought might be doing it. So we look at drought data, and what we can see here is that there was a pretty extensive drought in 2017. We could see here by these arrows, this is the year. But the drought doesn't match up with the sexual maturity of the fish. Three to four years, if we count 2017, 18, 19, 2020. Pretty high numbers, 2020, pretty high numbers. Then when the year class is here, dying off would have been the age class of a year with no drought. 2019 was the year I couldn't keep my traps in place because of how high the flows were in the rivers. Then we see one, two, three, maybe four, 
2019, one, two, three. Oh, all of the populations are declining precipitously. They're just not there anymore. They're not returning. So we have better passage. We have cleaner water. We have less predation, but we're not seeing more fish coming back. What's going on? Where are they? The freshwater conditions are improving. There's got to be something going on at sea in the, in the ocean where there's an influence on these fish. So after doing some de research and deep diving, we're starting to see that there is evidence to show that there's bycatch going on in the Atlantic herring and the mackerel fishery. So these two different types of trawlers, the bottom trawlers and then midwater trawlers could really be catching the missing fish. So to talk about that a little bit deeper, um, the Atlantic herring fishings, the majority of the landings come from midwater trawls where through the, the trawl, the big net is being pulled through the mid, middle of the water column. There's a small mesh near shore bottom trawl, uh, which is the bottom going along the bottom of the ocean. And then a purse seine, which goes around a school of fish, pulls it like purse strings and then brings them in. The purse seine is generally really only done in uh, region 1A, which I know it's hard to see, but this purple region off the coast of Maine. Um, and the small mesh nearshore bottom trawls and the midwater trawls are really where all of the landings come from. The midwater trawl is at, is the majority of where the Atlantic mackerel fishery landings come from as well. I want to point out here in this map that was just published from NOAA Fisheries Data in the Providence Journal. This map shows New England in New England where Atlantic herring are most heavily fished. So we can see that here. So off the coast of Maine, Cape Cod, and Rhode Island, Connecticut, Long Island. This is data from uh, UMass, and there's a couple important things I want to point out about this data. Uh, to start off, in 2015, the bycatch for river herring limits were changed. It went from 1.25% of the catch to 0.6% of the catch. So the al allowable catch limit decreased. Um, all of this data is from their uh, websites that update almost a week, almost weekly. Each cell is determined by the most recent catches. And all of the information is from portside observers or at sea federal observers. So what we're seeing here is in each cell, the amount of toes, so drags of the net, where either a high, moderate, or low river herring percentages were caught. So this is really showing us where the river herring are hanging out and where the densest populations are being caught. So we can see up here, Cape Cod, there's a 16 in a red cell. So that means there are 16 drags with high above that 0.6% limit. As we zoom in closer off the coast of Connecticut and Rhode Island here, we see same thing. We're seeing this is where the uh, most dense pulls of these crawls are being are capturing the highest density of river herring for Atlantic herring and Atlantic mackerel. So here right off the coast of Rhode Island, 19 trawls had that moderate between 0.5% and 1%. So all of this data comes from port sides here port side state samplers or at sea federal observers. In most recent years, since about 2019, in southern New England bottom trawl and southern New England midwater trawl, there hasn't been any observers, according to the New England Fisheries Management Council. So I want to talk a little bit about Amendment 8 as well. In January uh, 2021, uh, NOAA Fisheries recommended... Uh, NOAA Fisheries implemented an amendment 
recommended by the New England Fisheries Management Council to establish Atlantic herring uh, acceptable biological controls uh, that prohibited the use of midwater trawl gear in inshore waters from Canada to Connecticut. March 29th in 2022, midwater trawlers won a court, won the court case and that buffer zone that inshore waters where midwater trawl gear was no longer allowed to fish was opened again. Now those midwater trawlers are able to fish those waters again. That section in Maine did not go away. And you can see here in this, in this map, the buffer zone where Atlantic herring are not being fished. It does not exist down here. So in Maine, only about 3.2% of river herring and shad catch caps come from Gulf of Maine. The rest is from Cape Cod and region two down here in Connecticut and Rhode Island. So the Atlantic, fisher the Atlantic herring fishery is restricted in 1A off the coast of Maine here from January to June, and no midwater trawlers are able to fish until October, allowing the river herring to migrate. So there's some su suggestions from our end that we'd like to put forward and funding and observers needs to be more vigorous at port side at minimum. Increasing of the observer coverage is, is critical to be protecting these fish. Um, I also like to propose investigating time area closures instead of just complete closures, time area closures for river herring to be able to migrate in, the juvenile to migrate out, and then also still have potential to fish. So time area closures around these river herrings is really important. Also, uh, according to a Reed et al. paper, an updated DNA data set to identify the most impacted stocks would be really helpful. Uh, the the read at all paper was saying that uh, with these bycatch genetic samples can be being taken and then can find where all of these river herring are spawning from so we can protect each river river stock to protect the overall ocean stock. And then investigate reducing the river herring shad catch caps as well. So ways you can help. Uh, Save the Sound is a 501c3 nonprofit, so our goal is help from government agencies, private private foundations, corporations, and generous donors, and you can also become a Green Guardian today. So with that, thank you very much, and uh, look forward to answering some questions. So we have one question in the chat that I'll read um, from Jeff. Should hatcheries look to try and cultivate herring to help restart waters that have recently been opened up, like above Dana Dam in Wilton, or is it feasible to raise slash stock herring? Great question. So the state in, in the past when river herring numbers were really high, were doing what was referred to as seeding programs, where they would take pre-spawn adult river herring and truck them to a river where the river the population of river herring was not as robust these adult fish would then spawn in that river out migrate to the ocean following year would move back to their natal stream where they were raised to spawn again but those young of the year three to four years later will return back to their natal stream so wherever they were trucked to so that is one way that um, cultivating river herring has been helpful and successful in the past in rivers throughout the area. Actually raising them in hatcheries has been proven to be rather difficult based off of the life changes that they need for spawning, um, but it is not impossible. There are uh, landlocked alewife and blueback herring populations that do thrive just in freshwater, but from my understanding as not an aquaculturist, uh, river herring in hatcheries is quite challenging. So that's where that seeding comes in of wild fish back and forth to create the natal stream, uh, a more robust natal stream population.
I'll definitely let you know next time a seating event happens, Jeff. Any other questions, feel free to fire away. I see Lynn said, asked, what do you mean by 100% match? Oh, in the eDNA section, 100% match. 100% uh, match means that the entire genetic sequence, the entire snippet of the double helix of the DNA was captured in that water sample. So the entire code can be analyzed and figured out exactly to species specific what that animal DNA snippet is. If it's just a segment of it, sometimes it can only say it was a fish, it was a bass, it can't get into anything more specific than that. So 100% match means it had the entire genetic code in that DNA snippet um, to be able to get to spe species specific information. That species specific information is now being identified and trying to figure it out and analyzed further to see if now individuals can be picked out instead of just this is how many this is how many pairs of American eel DNA we found. We have eight full sequences of American eel DNA, or is this eight different American eels? Um, that's kind of the cutting edge of this DNA. Seems there's a question in the Q&A as well. Um, how much does eDNA analysis cost? Our land trust is doing some stream restoration, and I'm interested in doing this. Yeah, eDNA costs, depending on the laboratory you get it from, anywhere from 90. Uh, I'll see the lowest I've seen is $90 per sample, but it can get very, very expensive depending on uh, how much you're analyzing in that sample. If you want to do just fish is a different price than if you want to do fish and bacteria and uh, algae as well. So it's all a varying scale depend how in-depth your analysis is. See a couple more here. Okay, I can read the one from Abby. Do you have yeah. resources slash suggestions on how to best contact local representatives or other ways to get involved to advocate for increasing observer coverage and or time area closures? Yeah, there are um there are meetings held by the um New England Fisheries Management Council. Go on the New England Fisheries Management Council website. There's a meetings tab. Um, you can get on there. There's public comments. And um, that's that's a great way to get started and would be super helpful. I believe there's one coming up in a couple of weeks. The exact date is evading me under a little bit of pressure. But uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me and I'll set you up with anything you might be interested in. We are also working with regional and federal level to address bycatch. That's part of the uh, the New England Marine Fisheries Council meetings um, and also uh, other policy things that uh, the soundkeeper, Bill Lucy, is a little bit more involved in than I am on the more of the legal legislative side. Looks like there's another Q&A question, too. Um, who is responsible for providing observation on the herring fishing boats? Great question. Uh, the originally it's a was a federal federally a, a federally funded observer. Recently, there's been legislative change that the anglers themselves have to fund it, but it's a federal requirement. So that led to some turbulence in the fishing industry from saying that, well, this is a federal mandate, but we have to pay for it. So oftentimes there's one less mate on the boat actually doing it and one person doing the observing. So um, that gets a little bit challenging from uh, depending on who you talk to. But originally it was federal 
NOAA Observer funded. Um, from my understanding, funding got cut, and now it is the responsibility of the actual angler to support that funding. I also see a question from Patricia. Will there be volunteer opportunities to help with the Branford River? There very well could be in the future. Right now, all of the projects from our end are at the infancy stages. So currently right now, not right now, but in the future, we hope to have volunteer opportunities, yes. See one from Pam too. Uh, we do have plans to widen our research. Currently, right now, we are applying to a bunch of different funding sources for eDNA work. Um, we're having trouble getting all of the funding we need to do this project. So um, that is one of the hurdles why we went from a big, large study to just Norwalk River. Um, but we are we we do plan on it. We're just not having the easiest time acquiring funding. I just want to call out what Bill Lucy wrote in the chat. He's our Long Island soundkeeper at Save the Sound. Um, he said there will be an announcement in the Federal Register today announcing hearing Amendment 10 scoping comments in all New England coastal states. Connecticut will have an in-person meeting and we will need hundreds of individual comments. The comment period will be March through April. Thank you, Bill. It looks and like we'll, we have we'll make sure to send out a, a note to everybody. So if you join up as a member, if you're not already, um, we're going to, um, as soon as we're, uh, get the schedule lined out, we're going to, um, let everybody know, give you the links to where the comments are and, and a bunch of talking points, example letters, that type of stuff. Great. Any more questions? There's two more questions in the Q and A. Perfect. Um, one is, is the 10 mile river part of the West River watershed? I believe it's part of the Quinnipiac 10, 10 mile river. And then the other comment is, why spend money to remove dams when bycatch is only monitored is only 6%? Great question. Uh, yeah, so that to me indicates some issues with the mat management of, of the fish stock as a whole. Um, so all of this money is being spent restoring inland fisheries, the freshwater ecosystems, um, and it's just not being met on the other side of this fish's life cycle. I, I wish I had a better answer for that. And I know we're coming up on 1 p.m., but um, there's just one last question maybe that we could get to. From Stuart, there was a research done on chemicals in tires that were killing salmon fry in the Northwest. Has this been tested on river herring? From my knowledge, it has not been tested on river herring yet. Um, I butcher the name of this the chemical. It's like six DDH, D -D -D DPP, something like that. I, I can never remember it. Um, but we're aware of it. We're trying to figure out, yes, six PPD. Uh, we're, we're aware of it. We're starting to figure out ways to test for it. It is something we are trying to, um, start actively testing for. Um, we just don't have the lab equipment yet. Well, I don't see any other questions, so I think we'll wrap it up here. Um, again, I'll include um, the recording in a follow-up email, and I can include John's email as well if there's other um, questions that come to mind. But 
Thank you all so much for joining. Thank you, John. Um, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.